Okay, I think we're live now. So welcome to the seventh weekly virtual town hall for Anne Arundel County on COVID-19. We've changed up our format. It's very different from when we started. I think our first five were in studio at the Emotion Center so via Zoom. And we changed it a lot. Um, I'm not going to do a speech tonight. I don't think we're going to have a lot of speeches tonight. We are going to have a conversation. I'm going to have a separate conversation. health officer, my is for to you a lot of and and people is um territory it's a new time back in okay uh, all right I'm gonna assume we're still on <laughs> I think we might have had a little technical glitch um, but um I want to start with with Congressman Sarbanes, and I gotta say, Congressman John, can I call you John? Um, I gotta say, uh, you're one of my heroes. Um, you know, I think you're one of the uh, brilliant minds in Congress. I don't know whether everybody in Congress agrees with that, but uh, I I really wanted you on here to be able to ask you some questions and ask you what it's like right now in Congress. Um, but I really, really, really want to thank you for what you did in the CARES Act. Uh, there, there was um, a lot of fear from county executives and local leaders that they would not include funding for anything local, that it would be your sort of old-fashioned um, economic stimulus bailout, uh, welfare for the corporations kind of a stimulus. And the fact that you've got money in there for local governments to be able to address this crisis, both the economic uh, side of it, as well as the health side of it, is huge for us. So we just got our $101 million uh, direct deposit from the federal treasury. And, um, and I'm doing my budget address on Friday. And I can tell you, it's going to be a huge help. Uh, and we're putting together the programs for that. But we'll get into some of that. Um, but um, tell us what's going on in Congress. Yeah. Now. Well, uh, thanks very much for having me on the call, uh, Stuart, and I want to salute you and your team for the incredible effort that you've undertaken on behalf of the residents of Anne Arundel County. I mean, you're kind to salute the work that we're trying to do in Washington, and really what that is, is to put that relief and assistance out there to the country. But the fact is that we need executives who've got budgets and have uh, the personnel to really deploy this response to do that efficiently. And the more we have people like you and others around this region who are thinking smartly about how to use those resources, the more confidence we have in putting them out there and frankly, the stronger our argument will be that we need to continue to provide that relief. And I mention that because in addition to all of the support we tried to deliver through the first CARES Act and in the interim package that we passed last week, uh, we are now going to work uh, and making very strong arguments that we've got to get additional funding to state and local governments across the country um, and that's not some faceless bureaucracy, as you know. Those are police officers and first responders and firefighters um, and other public personnel that are delivering, delivering critical services to the community. And we know that with the incredible impact on our state and local governments with falling revenues and the other expenses that are coming at them, that that is a vital uh, assistance that we need to deliver. So thank you for what you're doing because I can point to the efforts of counties like Anne Arundel County uh, to your uh, county government in terms of how these dollars are being spent, where the focus is. 
in making the confident argument that we have to continue to bring those resources to bear from Washington. I wanted to mention just a couple of the, the most key supports that we delivered. Um, and people are, are, I think, familiar with these at this moment. We can talk about them more. But in the first CARES Act, we brought $350 billion uh, in to support small businesses uh, through the Paycheck Protection Program. We all know that it's been a bumpy ride, that it was oversubscribed within about 10 days, that there are still a lot of small businesses that are waiting for that assistance. Um, and we brought another um, $250 billion behind that effort last week with this interim package. Um, the number one priority is to make sure that it gets to the smallest businesses in our communities, that we reach out through community lending uh, institutions so that those who have the banking relationships with people in the community that are most living on the edge in terms of their businesses, that they get supported and that those opportunities are there. We can come back and talk about that a little bit later, but that's been a key program. In terms of assistance to individuals, the um, expanded and extended unemployment insurance benefits that we passed at the federal level, so it extends by 13 weeks, the normal 26 weeks of unemployment insurance that would be available. Um, and it also expands the dollar figure by $600 a week uh, for those who are qualifying for uh, these benefits. Um, again, we're pushing billions of dollars out the door onto systems uh, that have not typically had to step up with that kind of capacity. And we've seen some glitches in that at the state level. I think they're getting worked out but I know people are impatient about that and anxious. So hopefully those dollars will uh, be flowing in a way that can support folks. And then the other piece just to mention um, in terms of help to individuals are these direct payments coming from the treasury uh, in, in, a, in the form of rebates. These are the $1,200 that can go to individuals, $2,400 to joint filers, $500 uh, for um, children, dependents, 17 and younger. Um, and those are getting out the door in a combination of ways, direct deposits where the IRS has that information on file, um, checks that will be sent in the mail to those who don't have the direct deposit opportunity, uh, checks coming to our, our seniors, you know, our social security uh, beneficiaries in those amounts and so forth. So we can talk more about that and the timing of it. But the goal here, as you know, Stuart, is to help people get through this unprecedented crisis that we're facing. And I'll close my opening remarks, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here um, by doing what I do on every call, which is uh, thanking uh, the residents, in this case of Anne Arundel County, for all you're doing uh, through social distancing to do your part to contribute to our efforts to get to the other side of this public health crisis um, and to salute especially those on the front line, many of them who are county workers, uh, who are doing their best to keep us safe um, and healthy in these difficult moments. Uh, they're the folks that we're really trying to lift up every day and support. It's the number one motivating force behind our efforts in Washington right now. And the number one call I get from constituents is not people calling on their own behalf. It's people urging me to make sure that we do right by those who are on the front lines and trying to keep us safe. Um, that's been a real source of inspiration for me over the last six or seven weeks. With that, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I, I, um, I really was worried when the CARES Act was first being discussed and when the, the final bill came out, um, I really, uh, I do have to applaud you because even though getting that money out the door has been difficult, partly because of glitches in the bureaucracy, uh, it, it's it's balanced well and the unemployment benefits, and we're going to be talking to Kirkland Murray from, from our workforce development um, in the next segment about um, what, what the state and the county are going through and how difficult it is for people to get to get those benefits right now. And we know that the, 
the uh, PPP loans that the businesses are are um, eligible for. Everybody's lining up, and and that's difficult to get out too. I was glad to hear what you said about the community banks because here in Anne Arundel County, what we found is the you know the big national financial institutions have not been quite as interested in getting that money out to our small businesses, and we found that it's the smaller community banks that are working overtime. And I mean, literally staying up through the night uh, trying to get these applications in. And when they reopened Monday, you know, the line was there again. We're trying to get better information from the state on, uh, we have good information at the statewide level, but we're trying to get good information from commerce about um, who actually, which industries got the first round, um, what size businesses, what they're doing with it. And, and our economic development people are working on that. But Part of what we're trying to do on the whole economic picture is just get a good a good picture of what's going on out there so that we can fill the gaps left by the federal programs and the state programs. And that's what we're doing with our $101 million. So that's really, you know, things that only local government can do, like making sure that the food in the food bank gets out to the, the pantries and the distribution centers, and there's a shortage of that. And, and uh, something like an eviction prevention program that we've just launched, uh, we know people can't get evicted now, but when they lift that ban, uh, folks are going to be in trouble. So um, putting all those pieces together to create the safety net that, that you and I both believe this country should have had all along um, and building it now, it's an opportunity. And um, and and uh, that's what I feel like our job is at the local level is, is to see what you can pull off in Congress. Um, power to you. Keep going. Keep trying. We need that next round. Um, but then but then patching the holes. But but the other part of it all is is the actual fight against the virus, isolating the virus. And that's why we have Dr. Kalyana Ram Kalyana Raman here. I don't know if you two have met before, but you should. Do you know each other? I think we've met, yes. Yeah. Yeah. In, in passing, very briefly. But yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks for what you're well, doing. Thank you. I, I got I gotta say. Um, how long has it been? Six months, eight months since you came on, Alesh? Yeah, so actually, we're heading to eight month eight very shortly. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anne Arundel County did not have a permanent health officer for a couple of years before this. There were there were acting health officers and and uh, really good people who were doing their best. But when I came in, I knew that we really had to find a health officer who understood uh, really what we mean by community engagement in public health and um, and social determinants of health. And so I found this guy up in Baltimore. He was he was running healthcare for the homeless, a network of, of clinics in Baltimore City. And um, he was clearly the right person for the job. And then when this when this coronavirus pandemic hit, uh, I, I gotta say, and and you know, don't let your head get big or anything, maybe turn off the sound the light, but <laughs> Just watching him take a health department that was way underfunded, we know, you know, lack of state funds um, for and county funds, for that matter, for health, um, and building the department to meet the needs at the same time as, as being strategic about how we're going to actually isolate this virus and actually dealing every day with constant barrage of questions and interviews and, and you know, the day-to-day -day work. So I don't know how you do all that, Nilesh, but... Um, um, let me get. Let me let, let you have an opportunity to just give us a briefing on um, and and uh, talk to the congressman too, because he needs to understand what life is like right now in a local health office um, and uh, what we're doing here in Anne Arundel. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And um, it, you know, you, you described it right. We've had to redesign our health department to meet this challenge. We've had chunks of our health department staff. Um, particularly our school health staff or environmental health staff who really can't do their jobs in this environment. Schools are closed. Um, there's far fewer inspections that we're doing. And at the same time, we had this entire new body of work to do. And so we've reassigned a lot of people to do testing. Testing is really a key part of this strategy. Um, and we're providing walk-up testing in communities, drive-through testing. So we're testing five days a week now contact tracing, which we all talk about now, but health departments have been doing for decades. Um, but we're doing that, making sure that we contact trace every single person who is positive in this county. So over 1,500 and counting. Um, and we built out our capacity to do that. Um, and then isolation and quarantine. Uh, and, and really the key to isolation and quarantine is 
the case management that we do that our staff are doing. So, you know, there's the technical part of it, which is okay, this you need to stay in your house and stay away from people for this long, and then checking who their contacts were so that we can quarantine them so they don't uh, potentially develop it and pass it on to others. But what we're seeing in our communities is that there's a real need to help people address address the barriers to doing that. So housing issues, are you able to isolate or quarantine in your house? Do you have somewhere permanent to live that you can even do that? Um, food access, how is that happening? How are you getting meals? Making sure that people have income. And we've seen a number of people who they're the sole, uh, they're the sole breadwinner in their family and they're not working a job where they're gonna get unemployment or they're gonna get um, or they're going to get enough to feed their family. So we've had to deal with those kind of issues. And I think that in, in this environment, and the, um, the bills passed by Congress have been really helpful in putting those guarantees in place, but, and, and the state and the county. But in order to be successful over the longer term, those, that security net really needs to be in place for us to be able to continue this work. Because that's the real pivot when we talk about opening up we have to be able to test on demand the same day people have symptoms and our testing capacity isn't there yet. Um, and we need to be able to provide supports to keep people in isolation and quarantine. So that's really what we're looking to is going forward. We got you. Look what we're going to do, I think. Oh, is your... Um, can't quite hear you. <laughs> but, uh, can't hear? Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. I'm going to keep talking anyway. Maybe other people. <laughs> well, if I, if I could jump in for a minute, if you can hear me, I, I just wanted to thank you for your effort. Um, <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm I can bad. hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah, You're back. yeah, I yeah. think somebody, you know, you know, we're all at home. It might be, it might be that my kids are using too much of our internet or something. <laughs> uh, sure. But, but the, um, yeah, the part of this, the health side of this, and getting, I know you got, um, you know, hospital funding into the to this three point five round, which is really important. Um, but um, the 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 contact tracing work, uh, mm -hmm. we're actually. You know, take the story back. I know that the the, the Washington Post is going to be coming out tomorrow and, and meeting with the staff that's doing that. But there's a real story in this county that you know when Nilesh said that every single positive in Anne Arundel County has had contact tracing done on it. I don't think there's another jurisdiction in America that can say that. Certainly not in the state of Maryland. That while other other people started talking about contact tracing recently, we actually deployed all of our school, uh, a lot of our school nurses and school health staff into doing that work and and um Nilesha's epidemiology team put together a plan to be able to keep up so they've got i don't know it's 40 or maybe it's more than 40 now and it's growing um, yeah that that's doing that work and it's it's um it sounds like brutal work i mean they are hearing everybody's worst stories and helping them figure out how to isolate how to quarantine and all of that um and had strike teams out at our at our nursing homes, um, you know, weeks mm -hmm. before the state. A lot of this stuff, it's interesting. Every level of government, the further down you go, I think the more on it they, that that we are. That but it I, starts bottom yeah. and comes up. Yeah. Let me let me speak to that because um, I think you're absolutely right. We are we are constantly emphasizing now in our discussions in Washington. Um, within Congress, within our, within our caucus, how uh, getting the testing, the contact, the contact tracing in place and so forth is, is the key to getting back to any sense of normalcy. And that's still a long way off, but we, I think we're all, well, most of us um, are very respectful of the public health guidance that we've been receiving all along. And we know that we cannot um, reopen this economy, reopen our society 
um, if we're not taking really careful steps on the public health side, that has to be uh, the guiding force behind this. And I think you're absolutely right, Stuart. I commend you on this. We're going to get the best examples and models of how you do this from what's happening at the local uh, at the local level. We've had a number of uh, sort of worldwide experts, public health experts, uh, who briefed our caucus over the last two or three weeks. And one of the things they lament is how quickly, even some within the public health um, field, but certainly among political leadership, are ready to throw in the towel on the idea that we can actually get this kind of public health, traditional public health response with contact tracing and so forth in place because people will say it's too late, it's too difficult, it's too complex. Um, and what they've been saying to us is, no, this is the way out. Um, you have to tackle it. Um, it's not too difficult to do the right thing. And what Aleph and you and others are, are showing is that it is possible to do this. And I, I can guarantee you, uh, knowing what you just said about the fact that Anne Arundel County is, is in the forefront, that I'm going to point people um, to the efforts of the county as an example of how we can, we can get back to where we need to be as a country and a society. But it has to be done carefully. Uh, and I want to really thank you and your team for leading the way on that. Uh, hope is very important in this moment, but it has to be hope that's based on fact and truth and science and smart thinking. Um, and that's, I think, what you've designed in your response there in Anne Arundel County. I want to thank you for that. Thank you. And I think, yeah. you know, this, this is one of the challenges in public health is it really is an investment in, in communities to prevent. And, and one of our biggest challenges is that um, in preventing, nothing happens. And so people say, well, what's it doing? And what's it do what it's doing is making sure that nothing happens. And so that's really what we're talking about here is, is investing in prevention and suppression. Um, so I thank you for your support of that. So, Congressman, I know that you've you've um, focused on equity issues and ac health access issues a lot. Um, Nilesh, can you can you tell us what um, what you did? I know a lot of people have talked about equity, but I don't know that many people have done anything about it. And uh, mm -hmm. the equity initiative that we started and the and the the initial walk up test sites that you created. Yeah. So we 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 saw pretty quickly the uh, disparities in terms of who was COVID positive in our county. We saw a disproportionate number of Blacks and disproportionate number of Hispanics were COVID positive. And so we started a COVID health equity initiative a few weeks ago. We just had a third meeting yesterday, um, really with an eye towards how can we quickly understand what specific issues are happening and how do we solve them? Um, I think that those of us on the call are pretty much on the same page that there are disparities and we're not going to sit here and argue about that. And so we, we talked to, we talked, it was over a hundred people on that first call, um, leaders from around the, around the county um, to talk about what the issues are that they were seeing. And from that, we've had a subsequent meeting with the United Black Clergy group of over 30, um, 30 leaders from predominantly black churches in the county to look at, um, what sort of messaging is going to help in in reaching the reaching the folks that uh, they're serving? How do we push it through their network? We're having a similar call with Hispanic leaders um, on Friday, actually, uh, to do the exact same thing. We re revamped the pieces of our communications network to make sure that we're including those uh, those networks that are not getting that are not getting the information the way we intend. Um, and we also heard that there was a gap in gap in testing availability. And so a lot of the initial testing efforts were around drive throughs And so we wanted to have something that was a walk-up testing site. So we did our first, actually our first two ones in Annapolis City, um, where it was where it was walk-up testing. You could walk up, it was in a community. Um, our first time we did over 130 tests that day. Um, yesterday we did it in public housing in Annapolis and we had over 40 tests. And we're going to be doing that kind of walk-up testing sites throughout the county, really to reduce those barriers to access that we think are really a, a key part of 
uh, of how we're going to address the situation. So, Congressman, the uh, access to PPE and test kits and all of that, uh, you know, as you know, local governments and state governments are all competing globally to try to get this stuff. What's going on at the federal level? Getting any help? Well, well uh, I'll tell you what's going on. Obviously, I was not happy and many of my colleagues weren't happy with the initial federal response. Um, I think to be very candid, the administration uh, didn't move uh, fast enough to step up and continue to step up uh, behind this effort of getting PPE distributed across the country. We discovered that the strategic national stockpile uh, was not replenished at the level it should be. Things weren't being maintained there. And this um, at a time when we've offshored a lot of the manufacturing of those materials. So that's a that's a, a double negative right there that we have to fix uh, going forward. So it has meant that governors, um, county executives, local leaders have had to scramble to try to find these supplies uh, and end up competing with each other instead of us having um, a sort of overarching national strategy to procure these needed supplies. Now, one of the things we did last week, it was very important, was uh, we not only uh, put $75 billion additional behind hospitals across the country, we appropriated $25 billion for testing and also required that the administration develop and regularly report to us on a national testing strategy because we understand that uh, without that, we cannot move forward. Uh, we need to borrow the example and the model that uh, jurisdictions like Anne Arundel County um, are leading with, but we have to build a broader national response. Um, and we were hearing from Bill Gates yesterday, he was describing in pretty simple terms as he's able to, uh, how you could put the technology behind building a national platform for testing and reporting the results and so forth that then allows you to get that clear picture as you look out across the terrain. Uh, so um, we're going to keep pushing for that. We are going to demand accountability from the administration. Um, and all of this, Stuart, I think speaks to the need to, to up our baseline in terms of what public health infrastructure looks like in America. You can't start from zero or scratch in trying to respond to these kinds of events. You need to have in place a stable, continuous infrastructure and capacity when it comes uh, to public health. And we're certainly gonna insist on that um, as we move forward. I do want to, in these closing moments before you shift to the next part of your program, I want to come back and just thank you for focusing on this disproportionate impact. The fact of the matter is that this pandemic has laid bare the really blistering inequalities that exist in our country um, and in our communities. And the fact of the matter is that those communities and zip codes that have the hardest time accessing health care are the same ones that have the hardest time accessing economic opportunity. And they're the same ones who lack political power uh, when it comes to our campaigns and what gets done in the places where laws are made. Um, I'm gratified that there is leadership in Anne Arundel County that is super responsive to the concerns of all parts of the county and all communities and making sure that you're leaning in the direction of helping people who are in the most difficult position right now. Uh, so thank you for that leadership and the leadership of your team. Um, and thank you in particular to all the residents of the county who are doing their part, as I said, to get us to the other side of this, uh, this terrible pandemic. Thank you, Congressman. And, uh... Yeah, you're a pro, man. You got right to six minutes to to, to twenty nine minutes. <laughs> it is it is time to move on to the next panel, and um, you even got in the last word, which is even better. Uh, but but thank you, thank you. There there is one one little uh, question that we have from a listener that I want to ask um, because um, 
it's I think on everybody's mind. Everybody, uh, the, the demand for testing is so high, and uh, and maybe this is more for Nilesh, um, but this is from Lisa. Has testing in Maryland become easier with Governor Hogan's arrangement to get 500,000 tests from South Korea? Does Maryland have the testing supplies we need to use those tests? I know the answer is that we don't have the reagents and we don't have the swabs to be able to actually use those tests. But so I guess the question as um, as a health officer who's in steady contact with the state health department, um, where do we stand on that? Is that is that going to give us some capacity soon? Yeah, that should be giving us capacity within the next week or two um, as they're putting together all of those pieces and figuring out um, where they're going to be allotted. And we've had conversations around that. So um, it's coming soon is my understanding. And uh, I'm looking forward to using those tests, I can assure you. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Congressman. Um, we'll stay in touch as we always do. Okay. And, um, yeah. Um, keep up the good work. You thank keep you, up Congressman. the good work too. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right, and thank you, thank you, Nilesh. We're going to bring on now uh, two more people. We've got um, from Anne Arundel County Workforce Development. Um, we have Kirkland Murray, and from Anne Arundel County Department of Rec and, Rec and Parks, we have Jessica Lays, the directors of those two departments. And I really wanted the two of you on here. Welcome. Thank you, Thank sir. You Thanks for, for having us. For, for, for being in the Zoom waiting room. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted the two of you because, you know, we both just talk about where we stand right now, but also the future. I mean, we are going to come through this. We are going to do what I've been calling the Build Back Better plan. and both workforce development and rec and parks in very different ways um, are central to that. But uh, first, let's talk about life as we know it now. And let's start with you, Kirkland. And um, what's going on in workforce development? What role are you playing? Well, workforce development, th again, thank you for having me, Mr. County Exec. And, and thank you for all your support of workforce development. Uh, workforce development, we're still here. I mean, our career center up in Lithicum Heights and our community career connection. <laughs> In, um, in Mead Village and Freetown and in Stanton Center are closed, but we're still providing services to Anne Arundel County residents. You know, unfortunately, 34,674 of our residents are now unemployed and no fault of their own because of businesses closing down. But we still want to make sure that those residents are getting the services that they were receiving even before this pandemic happened. So what we've done is we've quickly shifted Put a lot of our services virtually. Um, individuals can still get one-on-one -on -one career coaching from our staff by um, calling and setting up an appointment and they're doing it by Zoom and doing virtual appointments. We put a lot of the workshops that we were having in the Career Center online. We have launched a bunch of uh, resource page papers to help people give them tips on best ways to uh, beef up their resume, to do interviewing, and things like that to help them get that competitive edge that they need um, as they go back to work. Um, you know, we've been reaching out to a lot of those um, 34,000 residents and finding out, um, you know, what do they need, what services they need, are they planning to go back to work? And the good thing about this is that a lot of them, what they've been told by their employers is that when this is over, they're, they're going to call them back. They may not call them all back on day one. It's not going to be a life switch and everyone goes back but they are planning to call these um, their workers back. So that's very hopeful that, that, you know, as your previous guest, the Congressman mentioned through the CARES Act, we, um, you know, individuals are getting a little bit of boost. They're getting um, additional $600 payment to help on top of the unemployment that they were already receiving. So this is helping individuals um, to get through these difficult times. We're still working with our business community and helping them. Um, our first thing was to make sure that the business community were aware of programs like the PPP or the layoff aversion program that Governor, Governor Hogan initiated. And we were very lucky that 38 businesses in Anne Arundel County took advantage of that layoff aversion um, plan that the governor put out. And that led to $1.1 million in loans or grant and hopefully turned to grants coming back to Anne Arundel County county businesses that allow them to keep their workforce in place. So we're very lucky about that, but we're still working with businesses to help them. Uh, we, you know, we're looking forward to be part of your initiative of build, 
bring them back and build better. Um, and working with businesses, we're starting to have a conversation with businesses now about how we can help them to recall their workers. If they need more workers, how we can help them attract those new workers. But then again, if some workers aren't coming back, you know, we want to be able to work with those workers to connect them to other opportunities. On May the uh, 7th, we're having a our first virtual hi um, hiring event. This is this allowed us to use technology in a different Who's way. Who's hiring? Who's, Who's hiring? hiring? Yeah. Believe me, sir, a lot of businesses are. I mean, you've heard about the national businesses, CBS, Domino's, things like that. But local businesses here, here in Anne Arundel County are hiring. A lot of the grocery stores, both the shoppers in Millersville and the shopper down, shoppers down at Carlton are hiring. Grouse um, grocery stores hiring. We have several businesses that are going to be part of our, our virtual hiring event, the U.S. Census. They're still looking to um, find workers to go out and do the door-to-door. -door. Um, Angel's Food up in Pasadena is going to be part of this. Brightview Senior Living have opportunities in Annapolis and in Crofton and Severin. Um, um, AK um, Security out of BWI is looking to hire. Tribute Home Care is looking to hire. And Baltimore County Police we're working with. Also, um, um, what about Amazon, I heard Amazon is Amazon hiring, and I was gonna say the biggest and the best for last, sir. Amazon, okay, okay. Amazon, <laughs> okay. hundreds and hundreds of jobs out in the BWI area. Amazon, and uh, with, for them, you just go to their website, they're um, right on their website, you can apply for jobs there, so they're definitely hiring. So, yes, okay, okay. And and the folks that are you mentioned the thirty four thousand six hundred and something um, those are the people who've actually had their unemployment claims processed right through Department of Labor. Yes. So there's another set of people who are still trying to get their claims, especially the ones who are eligible but didn't used to be right the the contract workers and the gig gig employees and and um, so um, and. I've been hearing lately, and I'm sure you've been hearing about people who have been uh, shut out of the system, the system breaking down because of all the traffic. Um, uh, how many more do you think there are out there that are still trying to get their claims filed? Well, I mean, you know, we, we thought it was slowing down. Last Friday was the first day that, as you mentioned, the contractors and the gig workers couldn't, couldn't apply. So that was last Friday. So that's going to be a big uh in um, uptick in number of claims that are coming through, first time claims coming through. Um, uh -huh. You know, some of the businesses that have been trying to hold off and not lay off their employees are, we're starting to see that a major uh, restaurant chain that owns several restaurants here in the county, they this week yeah. had filed and some of their employees are gonna be going. So, you know, our claims were trending down, you know, in the middle of this about three weeks ago, we were at 10,000 claims one week we dropped down to five thousand last week we were four thousand so we're probably going to go back up um you mentioned some of the problems that the maryland department of labor has been having with their um they launched a new website um the beacon one-stop career um site um that is not only for people to file for first-time claims but you know even though they've they've waived the work requirement um, doing this, but people still have to go in and, and update information every week. So with the new claims coming on, plus those people going up, they, it was just a lot for the system. So they've kind of um, just to some hours that um, on, on the weekends is really for individuals that need to go in there and update their work activity. And then the rest do you have of any, Do you have any advice, any advice for the people who've been trying to get through and, and are frustrated? The only thing I can say is be patient. They've they put a new virtual. Um, you would you would tease and Jessica about being in the virtual waiting room. They do have a virtual waiting room. You can see how many people are in front of you. You can also leave a message so they can call you back, or you can get notification when it's your turn to come in and file for that. So that's that should help a little bit, um, too. But yeah. you know, I know that the Secretary of Labor she's very frustrated about this, and they've been doing everything they can to get right. that system updated. I mean, you know, thirty four thousand. Yeah. But that well, is, that is well, three, for this. Yeah. right. That's three hundred fifty thousand Marylanders who are now mm -hmm. on unemployment. So that's just a lot of numbers from a yeah. system that wasn't used to that. So we just ask people to be patient, be persistent. We know that is painful. We know that you need the money. We know that you know you're talking about how you feed your family and things like that. Well, what, once they get in, their their um, the money will start from when they lost their job, right? It so goes back to when they first. You're not losing. You're not losing money each day that that you get. You have to wait. 
That is correct, sir. You're not losing money. It is retroactive back to that. And then in addition, that $600 in addition to that um, is definitely going to make a difference in people's lives. Right. Absolutely. Um, all right. We'll, we'll stay with us. Um, it's it's so important to have, have workforce development doing this. Um, I should note that your board is made up of everybody from, you know, employers to um, community college and educators that you work really closely with to labor unions to um, um, it, it's it's you're really right in the thick of the economy in a place where where um, where we need you and you're you're really serving the people in a good economy you're serving the people who are the, who are having the most trouble who are getting left out um, to get work and in this in this economy you're serving just about everybody so um, that's not the way you want it to be but it's going to keep you busy I'm sure yeah um, so an another part of all this that I have found fascinating is what's going on at our parks. And um, I think it was our very first budget, or not budget town hall, our first virtual town hall on this, that uh, we had a comment that then generated a lot of other comments on Facebook um, when I said people should get outside and people should um, enjoy nature and uh, be healthy and improve their health. Somebody said, yeah, and we shouldn't have to pay to get in the parks. And somebody else said, yeah, that's a great idea. And at the end of this thing, it was an hour long, um, I stepped down from the podium or wherever, and uh, Jessica Lays had already been in touch with people on my staff and then with her staff about how to make that happen, how to waive the fees for the regional parks. And they'd been waived through this whole thing. So Jessica, um, are people using our parks? Absolutely, you do not have to pay to go to a park. <laughs> And the numbers uh, are people. Uh, we had over 80,000 people visit our parks over the last week, which is a 30% increase over last year. So people are definitely using our parks. Good. Well, give us an update on what's going on in Rec and Parks, please. Absolutely. So first and foremost, I really just want to recognize our staff at Rec and Parks for their outstanding hard work and dedication during this crisis. I truly am fortunate to work for the best team. Um, in the last two months, we've successfully manned our donation centers with the county. We've provided free childcare for essential personnel. Uh, we've kept our parks open, as you mentioned, and we haven't skipped a beat with our regular daily operations. Uh, each one of our parks offer a very unique experience from trails and scenery to farmland and waterfront. The citizens of Anne Arundel County can go out and see what the county has to offer as a mechanism to cope with this crisis. Uh, while maintaining our six feet apart, visitors can now enter the parks without any fee um, from dusk to dawn uh, for exercise purposes. So that typically means you're jogging, biking, walking or hiking. Uh, for your safety, the visitor centers, the playgrounds, the dog parks, the pavilions and picnic areas, tennis and basketball courts, as well as our restrooms are still closed at this time. Uh, but we've been working really hard behind the scenes uh, to make sure that the residents of the county and their loved ones um, are protected and can use those parks safely. Um, I would like to offer that when residents are out at the parks to take a moment to just stop and say thank you um, or hello to the staff members that are out there working every day on the front line. Uh, we have great parks because we have great people. And those people working the parks have really done a fantastic job during this crisis. Uh, while we all adjust to this new norm, um, it's important to keep ourselves physically and mentally healthy. We've seen a lot of residents come out to the parks that normally wouldn't come out to parks um, and using them during these uncertain times. Um, as I said, it's a 30% increase to what we normally see in our regional park um, visitorship. Uh, access to that outdoors and nature's will relieve your stress, it'll lift your spirits and improve your physical health and resilience. Um, so get out there, use our parks, be outside. Um, currently, all of our permitted programs, our events, our activities, everything that our department does has been canceled or suspended until further notice. That means spring sports, the basketball, the hockey, soccer, and lacrosse have sadly all been canceled. 
as an athlete, as a rec coach, and a parent of two very active lacrosse players, that was one of the toughest decisions to make as a department. Um, but I'll assure you that we did it because it was necessary to preserve the safety of everyone. Um, the county is working diligently to process all of the refunds associated with those cancelations cancelizations uh, to help ease the financial strain that many are experiencing. Um, and we just thank everybody for their patience during that process as we have over a thousand refunds right now. Uh, during this unusual time, we can't really gather in person. So Rec and Parks is working to stay connected with our county residents. So follow us on social media. Go visit the Rec and Park page on the county website. Uh, we provide updates and information daily regarding our closures and our cancellations. And one day soon, we'll be posting reopenings and new programs. Uh, <laughs> I think it's... We, <laughs> Yay! We think it's important to stay engaged with our community and we'll continue to just put out there some interesting facts about our park, motivation to get people outside and moving, messages from our staff and more. Um, we've really been active in Rec and Parks and you know all of our staff would like to say thank you to you County Executive Stuart Pittman and to your administration for your ongoing support. Like you said, after the first town hall meeting, we have been in full force uh, making sure that we're meeting this, the needs of the county residents. Uh, we anxiously await towards the recovery phase, and we look forward to keep serving the community with a variety of exceptional services, programs, sports, and events. I can't wait to see everybody out there again after this whole thing is over. You know, there's something that I have noticed at Rec and Parks, and it's not just, I've noticed it in a lot of departments of county government, that some folks can't do their regular job, but there's other things that we need, we really need done. And it, it's happening everywhere all over the county. And it's been uh, really rewarding to see how public officials are stepping up, public servants are stepping up and doing whatever it needs to get done. So I went and I visited the um, Donations Management Center in Odenton that we had just done, uh, opened. And there were eight or nine at least Rec and Parks employees there who normally work at the pool. And, and they were um, sorting food that had been donated that was going to go to the food bank. And uh, that, I mean, that just did my heart good that, that um, they're just there. They'll do anything you ask them to do, right? <laughs> they just want to help. And, and, um, and I know that a lot of your staff also, I, I think I just read today that you've redeployed staff who normally work with, the recreation side of things that is largely closed, the sports side of things, sorry, that's largely closed down. And and now a lot of them are doing maintenance. Absolutely. That, tell us about how you've reorganized the department. So every Rec and Park employee's day-to-day has pretty much changed under this crisis. Um, we, within the first two weeks, shut down 41 school-age child care sites and turned around and opened up nine brand new sites that have never had child care before um, for the essential personnel child care. Uh, the staff in child care went above and beyond. They partnered with the Board of Ed and they're bringing in three meals a day. They're helping the um, child care with educational support and e-learning. We shifted all of our recreational staff. They're either in donation centers, some of them are working at the county food bank. Um, a handful of our rec staff uh, is working in the parks right now. So we have shifted our focus to things that we can do in specialty park projects, the maintenance, the repairs, preparation for when we do open. Um, a perfect example is in the pools. As soon as we shut down, we expedited a pool maintenance that probably would not have happened for months, but because we had the staff and we had the time and we went full force into getting stuff done uh, that we could achieve during this crisis. Um, as recent as today, we are now sending staff over to help with the Department of Aging, reaching out to our senior citizens and making sure that they're checked on and that they get the services that they need. So Rec and Park has had the mentality this entire crisis that it's all hands on deck. We, despite what's happening, what comes at us, we're more than willing to serve the public and to roll up our sleeves and get the job done. That's amazing. Wow. Thank you for that. And um, um, if people want to, I should, I should note here that, that people can get information about any county programs by going to aacounty.org and things having to do with coronavirus by aacounty.org slash coronavirus. 
Um, but you can get to rec and parks that way and find um, find a list of all the parks and um, not the activities because they're not going on, but the parks are there and they're open um, open to uh, to just get outside and be and be healthy. Um, uh, workforce development. You work with um, community college and um, so you're involved in a lot of training programs as well as just placing people into jobs. And uh, this is a curveball question, maybe, but um, as we build back better from this and the economy, you know, there'll certainly be some changes. Some businesses won't come back. Others will. Um, um, do you see do you see shifts in the workforce and do you see workforce development working with any other educational institutions to get people prepared for the for new jobs? I definitely do. I, I definitely think you're going to have some jobs that um that are going to be created from this. There are going to be new technologies, new new occupations that come out of this, uh, different ways of doing things. So that's one of the things that we're trying to keep our pulse on and um, go out there and try to find out what they may be and work with our business community to look at that. Um, you know, working with other things. One of the things that while we're while you know this time that we're that we you know that we're still working, but you know, looking to the future, we're looking at how we build apprenticeship programs. We know that's something that you're very, um, some very important to you. We're looking at how we build apprenticeship programs for new occupations. Um, we're working with the organization now and building apprenticeship programs in IT. Of course, how we get more people into the construction field. I mean, you know, construction is one of those industries that was looking, you know, needed a workforce before this happened. They continue to need a workforce. I mean, construction. You know, um, there are projects that are still going on now, um, but it's a workforce that is always looking for someone. So how do we get new people into the um, into the trades and using apprenticeship as a tool like that? So we're looking at working with apprenticeship um, organizations to build that type of training and things like that. So of course, our number one is still Anne Arundel Community College. We're blessed to have such a fine institution here that take workforce serious. They put a lot of their- I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that because they need some love. And and um, they are going to be so much more. I think their enrollment is going to go up, don't you? As it always does when the economy is not as good, people can't afford more expensive institutions. And uh, thank God for community college. And as if, you know, we, we're hoping, I'm still hoping that people who were laid off doing this will go back to their current jobs. But face it, some people are not going to want to go back. They're going to take this as an opportunity to look at transitioning. So they really need to go to the, look at the community college as a way to transition to other jobs. You know, the community exactly. college is doing good at moving a lot of their classes online so that they can still consist and serve the citizens of Anne Arundel County. Uh, we're looking at what workforce trainings that are going online so that we can continue to um, help put people in, support people going through workforce trainings. Great. So I have got in front of me a whole lot of questions from, from people who've been listening. And um, I'm going to do something crazy. I'm going to try to answer some of them. Probably I shouldn't even try because they're really for the health officer, but I'll go through through most of them. But the first one is really for you, Jessica. And the question is from Debbie. And it says, have improvements to parks currently been put on hold? Uh, no. In fact, we're trying to get done as much as we can out in the parks. Our capital budgets are still moving on schedule. We're having meetings on a regular basis with our engineers and our project managers um, to make sure that things keep moving through this crisis. Um, I would actually say that some of our parks are getting more done right now because we're bringing staff in from the rec side to help with like maintenance and and cleanup and preparation and repairs. So we are we're trying to get everything done that we can during this crisis. That is great news, and I've noticed that as well. I went out to Quiet Waters, and and uh, you and your staff showed me some of the some of the uh, painting and facelifting that's been going on out there. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to whip through a few more of these. Are the zip code map numbers only representing people that have been ho hospitalized? This is from Ellen. Um, she's talking about the maps on the health department website, the county website that show the number of cases in each of each of the zip codes. And the answer is no, it's all positive tests, um, uh, in those zip codes. Um, where has contact tracing been done in the county? Also from Ellen. Contact tracing has been done in every case, as we heard from uh, Dr. Dr. K. Uh, so wherever it was, wherever it came in as a positive, um, that person gets a phone call from our um, our health department staff, and uh, 
they help them figure out their quarantine, and then they ask them who they've been in contact with, and they call all of those folks no matter where they are. Um, Jean asks, can we be given daily numbers on how much our hospital system is being loaded since the goal of flattening the curve was not to overload the healthcare system? That's an excellent question. And we have a weekly meeting with our hospitals, our two main hospitals, and, and um, we, we believe we're very close to releasing that data and putting it back on the dashboard. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of um, people who have to be consulted about this kind of thing. They're private institutions. Um, they're, they're parts of, one of them is part of the University of Maryland medical system. And we think we will have that information public soon. And on all these issues about data and transparency, Within the, the health field, they're very careful about trying to protect the identity of patients by law um, and not give out too much information. And they're very careful about um, how information gets used and whether or not it's going to be used for the wrong reasons. My own theory is that any information that we have, we should err on the side of transparency, that when you don't give people information, they don't trust you. And so we've been pushing the state to have the authority to get more to, to, to be able to put information out. Um, and, um, and everybody's been pushing at the national level to be a lot more transparent than we've been with information. Um, uh, how much testing are we capable of doing? Uh, our health department has been prepared for more testing than there are kits and that there are resources for. There were three times when we started to stand up drive-through testing sites that we ended up canceling because we didn't have the test kits. And um, um, we have the capacity in our health department to deploy a lot more tests than we have. And we're crossing our fingers that these half million test kits that don't yet have reagents and swabs, we'll have them soon so that we can really expand the testing. Um, um, why does the focus seem to be at the corporate level and not the household level in terms of where the money goes? I think we're talking about federal money. This is from Steve. Um, and you may have heard me say to the congressman that I was pleased that it did not all go to corporate America. There has been a lot of the PPP money that went to publicly held companies and it shouldn't have. It was supposed to go to, um, to small businesses. And um, I'm hoping that there's some oversight uh, by Congress, of the administration, on that, but the fact that so much money is going directly into unemployment insurance and those $600 supplemental pay payments um, is um, and local businesses um, is is actually good news the way I see it. Um, is the state going to test all senior living facilities? Um, our health department has been out there with the strike teams from the very beginning, giving advice to those facilities about. Um, the pre best practices that they can use to prevent spread and data is now going to be available um, on, on, on our senior living um, facilities on the positive cases. Uh, they are not testing people who don't have symptoms. Um, and that is something that we want to get enough test kits to be able to do all tests of everybody in those facilities. Um, but they are, they are prioritizing those facilities for testing right now. Um, uh, can we expect youth sports to be canceled in the fall? I hope not, <laughs> but nobody can say, nobody can give us an answer to that. We're hoping that there's not a second wave of this thing and that by then, um, we are, um, while still probably doing some social distancing and some, some precautions, um, but we hope to be playing sports. Um, should I get tested if I don't have symptoms? Well, the answer to that is it's very difficult to get anybody to test you if you don't have symptoms. The health department is not testing people who don't have symptoms because they have to preserve the test kits for the ones who do. Um, I think that's most of the, the stuff that I'm looking at. Um, so um, uh, we're just about out of time. And uh, so, any final comments from either of you? No, we're just looking to, like you said, build Anne Arundel County bigger and better when, when this is all over. Well, build back better. That's 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 the better. that's the title we're gonna use for all of it. And I can guarantee you that you, Kirkland, and you, Jessica, are gonna be a part of that. 
Um, we're going to have every county department engaged in that process. And I'm going to be asking you how your agency uh, might look different in the future. Are you going to have more people working from home? Are there other, other services you need to provide? Um, are there other things we need to do in Rec and Parks? Do we need to look at our capital budget differently? Um, and then we're going to be engaging with your, your clients, too, um, with people who are looking for work, um, with people who are using our, our parks facilities, and, um, and engaging with all the business sectors. And uh, through Open Arundel, which is, you know, this new, new web portal that we have, uh, where all of your performance metrics are going to be visible at some point soon, um, we're going to be engaging people in that process of, um, of Build Back Better. You know, what, 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 is this, what has this taught us? Um, what can we do better in the future? And um, my own view is that um, both of your agencies are going to be front and center in everything that we do. So thank you for being with us. We'll be back next week with a new, a new group of uh, fantastic um, public servants and maybe some residents as well that are really um, um, doing good work in this time. So thank you very much. Thank Both you. Of you.